Hi everyone, welcome to our Composer Hangout. We're very excited to welcome cellist Matt Heimovitz for Hang with Heimovitz today. Um, so also joining us will be Eric Siblin, Luna Pearl Wolf, pianist Christopher O'Reilly, Roberto Sierra. Um, so we'll be discussing the overtures to Bach, the relationship of Bach to the 21st century, and also the influence on various composers of different genres of music. So thanks again for tuning in. Over to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe start um, with Eric, um, who, who I'm, I'm just fascinated because, you know, you, you were a pop critic for all those years at, in Montreal at the Gazette, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Bach cello suites, um, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, how, you know, you've written the book on the Bach cello suites, um, when, when did you first come into contact, how did they change your life, you know, and, and you know, where, where are you now with, with these pieces? Um, and uh, and then I guess we can get in from there into the discussion of these new overtures for the for the cello suites that, that I've commissioned. Uh, sure, uh, I happened upon them in a Bach year, the Bach year of uh, 2000, in which it was it was pretty common to hear uh, marathon performances of Bach's music, and so the cello suites uh, was a was a favorite candidate I think that year because it's uh, it's really a marathon performance to play all six and. We can raise a question as to whether it's a good idea or not. But I, I, uh, I heard the uh, the eminent uh, cellist Lawrence Lesser play them uh, actually in, in two segments. So I heard three of the suites, and uh, and I knew I had no background on the music, and I was suffering from sort of a pop music uh, overdose in many respects. I had just stopped working as a rock critic for the Montreal Gazette, and I think I was I was really searching for something new musically, and I I, I didn't know what that might be. Uh, as it turned out, I think the Bach cello suites really answered that need of mine. Um, I think first off that uh, I didn't have any background in classical music, and one doesn't need a background in classical music to appreciate the music. It's got a very um, kind of uh, pure, almost folk music quality. I find you know you've got one uh, one instrumentalist uh, playing uh, you know four strings essentially, except for the sixth suite, and uh, and is producing this really, really oceanic, uh, incredible music. So uh, just from the point of view of, of uh, a listener who is not schooled in classical music, it was a very accessible way into Bach, a very good portal into the music of Bach, which I think had I perhaps been listening to a cantata, Glorious, as I find that these days, it might have been a bit off-putting for all sorts of reasons, including the foreign language and the, uh, you know, the religious content and so on. But uh, a Bach cello suite, I think, as a guitar player myself, I was able to really relate to fingers doing such, uh, you know, uh, dazzling things on the fretboard, on the fingerboard. Um, and um, uh, so that spoke to me. And, of course, the music just uh, uh, really floored me, and uh, that marked the beginning uh, of my, my journey with Bach. It was just a sheer... Uh, wonder of, of hearing and seeing the music for the first time. I think seeing uh, had a lot to do with it. And the other thing that I think, uh, without going on uh, too long, I'll just quickly say that the other thing that really uh, uh, got me smitten about this music was the storyline. As I started to piece it together very early on, Lawrence Lester had circulated program notes, and those program notes pointed to various mysteries in the music, whether it was um, uh, the 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 somewhat unknown Monsieur Schuster, who, uh, for whom the, the fifth cello suite, the lute suite uh, version of the fifth cello suite was dedicated to, to the mystery instrument of suite six, uh, likely a violoncello piccolo, uh, and that sort of thing, notions that perhaps uh, the second suite was a sort of tombeau or uh, epitaph for the, the death of Bach's uh, first wife. Uh, uh, all of these things uh, conspired to make me feel that there was a fascinating storyline in the music itself. And uh, that's that's what got the ball rolling for me. And just very quickly, I, I want everybody to have a chance. But um, what what was the first recording? I mean, you, meant, you mentioned uh, Larry Larry's performance, but was there a recording that you first were drawn to? Or well, because uh, uh, because he was speaking, I think uh, a good deal about Casals uh, in his program notes, uh, and because Casals plays such a wonderful uh, dramatic role in the. Uh, the resurrection, if you will, of the cello suite. So that's the recording I went to at the outset, and I found many subsequently. 
But um, I also found that because Casals wears his heart on his sleeves in such a romantic way, for someone uh, searching for a storyline in the music, uh, he was very uh, useful and uh, and helpful to just you know uh, create the creating these these bold sort of larger than life uh, statements. So it, and so it was Casals at the outset. That was my first encounter with the Sweets, too. I, I had just started playing the cello. I was eight years old, and my parents brought home the LP set of Pablo Casals, and and uh, and that's that's uh, my first introduction to, to these to these cello suites. My first teacher, Gaboraito, actually was a student of Casals, and so uh. that's how we that's how we. Uh, I mean, Bach was part of the diet every, every day. But speaking of Casals, Roberto Sierra, who's one of the composers, uh, he wrote the overture for the fourth suite of Bach. Roberto, you, you have a, a direct connection to Casals, I believe. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I knew him, well, no, I mean, I was, I was very young. I was a student. I played for him the piano, a piece that I think he did not like because, it, you know, Casals was a very traditional man and music existed only in that realm of, of music from... from from basically Bach to Brahms. So uh, at one of his birthdays, uh, we went to his home in, in Rio Piedras in Puerto Rico. He married actually a Puerto Rican uh, ex-student of his. Her name is Marta. Marta is coming as is known now. So we went, a group of students went to his home and there was a big celebration. So I played with a with a friend of mine, Mamer Roa by Ravel, and of course that was very avant-garde for Casals at, at that time. I mean, Ravel was a classic, but for Casals was a, a sort of music beyond the sphere of what, what he really liked or comprehended aesthetically. Um, also, I, I, I sang in, in the choir, I remember singing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony with Casals conducted. So I, I had I had this all this interesting connection. Of course, I saw Casals uh, playing the cello uh, in the very last years, and I, I remember his wife tuning the pegs for him. He was sitting, and Marta would kind of do this for him. And it's interesting uh, this what Eric was saying about grand statements because Casals was really fond of talking in 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 this kind of grand way. Sometimes at the risk of becoming platitudes. But but he did that, you know, and he exercised his authority on everything. Uh, it was a figure larger than life, yeah, and, and, and an amazing performer. I mean, I I think that one can critique Casals all you want, but you cannot deny that he was one of the great players of the late 19th century and early 20th century. That's that's clear to me. So so when I invited you to uh, to write an overture for the fourth suite. Um, did did that inform in any way, or, or were you? Uh, I I could other issues. I could not avoid thinking of Casals, of course, and I could not avoid remembering, like 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 him, his tone of voice. I <laughs> like he would he would he would when I was singing the Beethoven's Ninth and he was conducting, he would sing it in this heavy Catalonian <laughs> accent. The loy 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 loy. So, <laughs> oh, so that's how I'm supposed to play your piece. I didn't know. <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean, of course, it's there, and you know, it's. Uh, I also want to comment on something Eric said, and maybe maybe Luna can can uh, sort of comment on this. I mean, we, we see these pieces as for what they are, they're like cathedrals of music, but in a way, a lot of this music I tend to think was written in a very non-pretentious manner, almost like, I mean, it's like like the preludes and fugues, the clavier übung, almost like exercises, like house music. I, I don't know that Bach ever imagined that, that, that his music would be revered beyond description the way it is now and the way it deserves to be revered. But, you know, a lot of these things are, are even sort of quasi-theoretical, practical, Propositions, so to say, you know, it's it's what each, each of these pieces represent in a way to me. But but of course we view them now as these huge cathedrals, and and that was in a way very intimidating for me as a composer. How do you, Luna? How does one 
sort of uh, write an overture for such a piece. I mean, that's that to me was oh my god. <laughs> and then I and then on top of that, Casal singing the Beethoven Ninth with the Catalonian accent. I mean, it was just too much. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to say that I didn't have that in my ear at the same time. <laughs> but I, I, I totally agree that it's it's a ridiculous task. I mean, thanks a lot, Matt, for you know. Exactly. <laughs> but, but in that sense, you have to sort of you have to make that leap of faith that that if you've drunk in the music enough of the Bach, that some some part of its genius will have seeped into your pores to such an extent that you can produce something that relates without necessarily being up to Bach's own standard of, of knowing why it might be, you know, why it might it speak in that way. And, you know, in my, in my compositional career, um, weird things happen sometimes. You know, you'll, you'll construct some, some bizarre relationship between themes in the beginning of a piece and only discover 20 minutes later in the music that it is the key to everything that you intended from the beginning. And of course you could never have known that. It sort of comes out of the ether, these these solutions that that are in a way miraculous. Um, and I think there there for me in the, the overture that I wrote, there were some relationships that that were both um, very coincidental, very sort of by accident, and also kind of miraculous that, that made, made me able to to produce something that I feel like does feed into the six suite in a in a reasonable way, <laughs> in, a, in a decent sort of handoff and and a reverence. Uh, but I'm not sure that you can actually intellectualize that enough to think about it ahead of time. <laughs> it's it's too intimidating. <laughs> I, I'm I'm curious about uh, from Chris Chris' point of view. Um, what what uh, Roberto was saying about about the uh, you know the, Bach not necessarily realizing that his music would have this significance that it did. I mean, and 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 just in terms of, I mean, for me in the in the six suites, he's synthesizing so many vernaculars and dance forms, and and I'm just I'm I'm, you know, would Bach have appreciated a shuffle play listen show, <laughs> you know, and, and you know what I mean? Like, was he was he doing that already with his with his music? It's interesting. I mean, even uh, even though these pieces represent, you know, a, a confined sort of, I mean, the Beethoven, for instance, is over a much wider lifespan, let's say, than the um, than the Bach suites. Wouldn't you say, Matt? I think I've lost. That's you, true. The the the, uh, the Bach suites are. It's a it's a one year, probably yeah. likely. You know, and even 20. and even so, you know, we we have you know various. Um, Possibilities, at least. I mean, I had a, a one one young cellist on the show who, I don't know how prevalent this uh, this point of view is, but the, the fifth suite is he he saw sort of the six suites as stations of the cross, being of a sort of a religious bent himself, young man. And um, so yeah, the fifth was the crucifixion. The first was creation. Have you have you come across that? I've I've seen something to that effect. I mean, I, for me, it's mm -hmm. the fourth suite, is the crucifixion. But <laughs> yeah, and, thank um, you, Matt. Maybe the fourth fourth street was the uh, was the circumcision. I think. Is oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's. I mean, interesting from that point of view that they could be so characterful each on their own, and yet. Basically, be coming out of you know a, a very conscribed period of time and have such different characters. But I, I love Luna's comment and and uh, point of view that uh, sometimes you know speaking to your question about did he think they were going to be very important over time? I think you're just in the middle of it, as she says. And sometimes what you think is the beginning is the middle, or is maybe the key to the whole set of them. So I think he's you know he he, he was just in this world and. Luckily, he was able to notate that, and it's all for us to to uh, delve in and and get so much of what's there just inherently. I mean, one thing we know about him is he was very busy. He had a lot of music to produce. He had twenty kids to bring up. He had, you know, at least one wife at a time. So <laughs> um, the guy didn't have a lot of time for for um, you know patting himself on the back. <laughs> I think he, even well, even if he was aware. The depth with which he was thinking about these things was just part of his life, like you were saying. Yeah. 
but I guess I guess for me, I'm I'm I mean I'm intrigued that Eric, you know, coming from a pop background, um, was drawn to these suites. And I mean, part of what I wanted to do with the overtures was the idea that that Bach was was working with these vernaculars, and I I wanted to sort of expand the palette of vernaculars and and sort of world influences. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that if Bach knew Caribbean salsa. <laughs> we, we'd have we'd have a courant in you know <laughs> with that with that beat to it and you know or or whatever I mean he, you know there's no no doubt in my mind that he would he would incorporate um, what what he heard and, and what 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 was going on so so I, I kind of wanted to expand that global sphere with these with these overtures and I I mean I you've done it Roberto with with the Latin Latin influences in your work Luna's bringing in. Um, you know Hawaiian chant and developing that, mm -hmm. and and kind of the way the vibrato and the vibrations work in that chant. It sort of leads right into these this kind of string crossing drones of the of the opening prelude of the of the sixth suite. And uh, you know VJ Iyer has uh, who unfortunately is teaching a class right now at Harvard University. I couldn't could, he was about to join but he, he couldn't come right at four. Uh, you know he's he's influenced by by his jazz background and sort of jazz grooves and and uh, has me has me sort of <coughs> at times emulating a drummer and and sort of amplifying the overtones inherent in in the in the suite and and uh, Duyun bringing in Serbian and Greek chant uh, in, into into her her approach to the second suite so um, yeah I, I guess I, I wonder like Chris when you when you play the Goldberg variations. Um, do do you sort of are you are you attuned to some of those let's say vernaculars or or like sort of the the folk quality I of think, it or, or or is it I think well not not only the folk quality but I think the pop quality that you bring up is quite you know I mean there are certain inherent characteristics to certain rhythms and rhythms and riffs that I think uh, can come directly out of contemporary popular music or contemporary. Uh, contemporary memes uh, of, of composition. I mean, there's so much that I think you know Philip Glass and Johann Sebastian Bach have in common. I'm I'm doing uh, actually the next time I play the uh, Goldbergs will be prefaced by Philip's Metamorphosis in, uh, Number Two. Nice. When, as a listener, Matt, if I could just uh, pipe in that uh, yes. when you raise a question of how responsive Bach may have been to uh, vernacular uh, forms and uh, uh, and what can be read into his music. I was really struck by what, uh, well, to, to flip the coin really, is what, uh, what Bach's future did with his music and how, how uh, responsive to Bach's music so many other genres have been, over in the, particularly in the past century. Uh, it seems that there's something uh, very changeable and malleable and reinventable, if I can use that word, about Bach's music that I find really striking. I mean, it, it started very early on with Bach himself, we can argue, who, who would read Jig. I mean, uh, to take uh, the cello suites as an example of how he was able to uh, turn the fifth cello suite into a lute suite, or, or vice versa. We don't know which came first because they're both so convincing. And then in the 19th century, you have uh, composers like Schumann, uh, writing a piano accompaniment to the cello suites. Uh, you have uh, people like uh, Charles Gounod putting together these ditties, like, um, uh, like uh, um, Abby Maria, of course, and she will uh, safely graze. And you've got Spakowski coming along and reinventing Bach and these really larger than life, lush, uh, lush terms. Uh, jazz music would follow, uh, swing jazz like uh, Jacques Lussier did really convincing accounts, I think, of Bach that are uh, super enchanting. Uh, in the 1960s, what have you got? The Swingle Singers, uh, uh, Wendy Walter Carlos, uh, uh, or Wendy, Walter became uh, Wendy, I suppose, uh, uh, switched on Bach, was immensely influential, uh, both for the popularity of the synthesizer and... Um, and for Bach's music itself, kind of turning Bach on to a, a hippie generation. Uh, rock music uh, assimilating Bach, whether it's uh, bands like Procol Harum uh, in, in that uh, song, Whiter Shade of Pale, which appropriated uh, uh, Bach's music. And then right up until the present, where you I've got versions of uh, 
uh, Cuban sort of fusion with Bach and uh, East Indian uh, Bach, West African, uh, and not to mention all sorts of jazz approaches. But to my mind, it's just it's astounding how well all of this is pulled off, how successful it sounds, and it makes me wonder what is it about Bach's music? Is there something about the steady rhythm of Baroque? But but then we don't see Bach's contemporaries being reinvented or uh, transmogrified to anywhere near the same degree, whether it's uh, Handel or Telemann. Or, uh, so is there something in Bach's special genius? You know, he was re reportedly uh, had great skill at improvisation. Is there some sort of a nugget of improvisation that's kind of embedded in Bach's music and that uh, performers can somehow tap into? Uh, or, um, but I find that super intriguing from a, uh, a popular music point of view. Um. I'm, I guess I'm, I'm curious for the two composers. Could, could we just, um, Roberto, how, how did you begin? I mean, I, it, it is a daunting task and um, maybe a little crazy, but how, 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 did you, how did you start, how did it formulate your, your overture to the fourth suite? Um, I, it, it, it's an interesting thought, I mean, to, to think back of how did I approach the piece. It was clear to me that I wanted to be referential to the Bach piece, and I, I want to, to, to go for Eric's comment here regarding um, what is it in Bach that, that makes it so adaptable, so to say, to, to different types of genre. And I can tell you this related to, my, to, to, to what I did in my own piece. Um, in fact, the moments that are more salsa-like, and this is this is what Matt would be doing with the pizzicato, is is sounding almost like the accompaniment to a Montuno riff, are are the ones that are actual quotes from Bach in, in my in my overture. And I I can tell you that there is something very both rich and basic in the sequential nature of Bach's music. So the, the, there are harmonic harmonic sequences that, for for reasons of the way they were assembled by Bach himself, that are very malleable and adaptable to many different styles. So you can you can have a bossa nova with a Bach sequence, or you can even have a, a salsa piece, uh, or or a, or a Bach sequence turned into a salsa piece. I mean that is true also of other Baroque composers, but I think particularly so in Bach, and also because of the the sort of the harmonic richness of it. I, I think it's it's also very very inspiring. Um, so going back to my specific approach to composing this piece, I I, I, I titled it. Uh, not overture, although it's, it is an overture to these pieces, but La Memoria, and that means memory. Because I, I, I have been concerned, uh, because I, perhaps I'm losing my memory now as I get older. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot about memory and how it works, and, 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 and how it works in relationship to music. So, in a way, musical form cannot exist without a clear conception and a clear sense of being able to, to, to remember things because if you have a sonata so how, how do you know that that then that was that is the re-exposition if you don't remember the exposition I mean that's a very you know put in a very simple matter so 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 in a way my my approach was kind of taking apart the Bach and either ne neg negating the Bach or fully embracing it and I already spoke about the embracing of it which is when the salsa rhythm comes is, is when the Bach piece actually becomes more crystalline from the harmonic sequences and then also because the prelude to my suite to the fourth suite is, is basically harmonic sequences constantly starting E flat and then it, it unfolds on and on except for certain recitatives so so the negation part comes about where I, I and I was mapping my piece to Bach's piece, not exactly bar by bar, but but quasi bar bar by bar. So so the parts that negate the Bach suite are the ones that use all other notes, but the ones that Bach were using at that given moment. So I had this kind of I mean, this is getting now very boring theoretical, <laughs> but I was asked to explain it. So yeah. so is this this sort of this sort of the Bach piece doing that 
in, in this background and foreground, the way I conceive the piece, and eventually becomes this aspect of memory. Ah, okay, so this is the piece, I remember it, which in my conception only becomes clear when Matt starts to play the four suite itself, because then it's, it's the, clear, the clear sort of flashback of what was trying to be remembered in my piece. So that, that's what I did. Great. I think we're going to wrap this up soon, but I just want to ask Luna kind of the same question, just uh, how, how did you begin? And I mean, well, I know how you began, because I, <laughs> the, first, the first reaction was, no, I don't have time to do this. Um, <laughs> um, after I twisted your arm, then what was this? How did, how did well, you come to this? I just want to say I love Roberto's idea that something that comes before the Bach could be the effort to memor to remember something that you haven't yet heard. I think this is a beautiful idea, and, and it, it comes off so wonderfully in your piece, especially for someone who's aware of the fourth suite and has, is familiar with it, because you start to realize that in this foreign land, you've actually, um, you know, the fourth suite is starting to emerge uh, out of the, the pizzicato, and, and that moment in, in your piece that, that you hear that is just, like, mind-blowing. And I, I just wanted to say that I love that about your piece. Um, so, I mean, an interesting question. When Matt approached me about writing this overture, as he said, I was so deeply embedded into the opera that I'm writing about, uh, about Lili Uokalani, who's the last queen of Hawaii. The opera is called Better Gods for the Washington National Opera. Um, I... I really could not find a moment to get my head into the place it needed to be to come up with with something brand new to begin with. And so I was very, and as, as Roberto said, I was, it's such an intimidating task to address a box suite like that. So, so um, basically I said, I'm going to take some time and figure out if I can do this before I really committed. And... And so I was looking at the at the sixth suite, and of course I was very inspired by the fact that it's for the cello piccolo. So so to write, I've written a lot for cello. Obviously, I've had a great time learning every mm -hmm. every time more and more about it, and torturing Matt to the best of my ability. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, to that challenge of writing for the cello piccolo with another string on top was very very exciting. So um, so I started to study. Um, well, in truth, parts of my opera that had been cut out, because in the process of writing the opera and doing doing workshops and things, we we found that there was a lot of material that that didn't really need to be there. And so I was looking, I was sort of sifting through this because I knew it was already in my head, and I thought if I can if I can find things that are already in my head to work on for this piece, it will save that whole period of sort of brain shift that you need to find something new. <laughs> um, and I, I didn't necessarily have a lot of hope for that. And then I discovered this relationship between the Hawaiian chant and the way that I had... Uh, what, what I did for the opera was find a way to create a harmony out of what is essentially a, a monotone chant from pre-Western Hawaii. And the, the, so the harmonic and technical solutions that I had found for that actually fit in a weird sense, just like a glove, into what happens in the opening of the sixth suite with the string crossings and the skipping around to, to other pitch levels, but always returning to that to that D back and forth. And um, <clears throat> so I started with that idea. I said, if, I, if that relates, how can I find other ways in which uh, this material can, can foreshadow or relate to the Bach um, I don't think I was trying quite as literally as you were in terms of a memory of the suite itself, but I did try to look at what makes that sixth suite so incredible and so so much sort of out of the stream and yet still in it with the suites. For the for example, the, that crazy storm thing that happens in the in the middle of the um, <clears throat> of the prelude, and so <clears throat> excuse me. So I did take some of those formal elements and try to find ways for the music. That I was starting with to to develop into the to sort of foreshadow and hint at those different ideas. Um, is that enough? Or is that <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, I think they want us to wrap up. But I I, I guess just in thanks so much, you guys for uh, for joining us on this hang. Um, <laughs> but I I just I, I I I'm reminded though I I just I mean I have to just mention Chris's uh, opening mm -hmm. to uh, Dance of Maya, which. Uh, are, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you you pretty much wrote the you know the, the, the guitar solo 
uh, of John McLaughlin like verbatim for for me in you know at the heart of this <laughs> arrangement of Dantamaya note for note, but you opened it with your own kind of fantasy, uh, very much inspired by Bach, I would think, right? I mean, am, am I right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I, I also just have to mention that uh, you know, uh, Eric, I don't know, I don't know if you realize, I don't think you've had a chance to to hear my new recording yet of the Bach cello suites, but I'm playing no, on Baroque cello. Yeah, Baroque cello. We'll get you a copy. Um, Baroque cello and cello piccolo, and that that whole idea of, of playing on period instruments really started uh, with with my project of Beethoven with Chris. Um, we, we we play with forte piano and and my cello is strung up with with gut strings and you know after after having experienced that and thinking about I knew that I was going to make a new recording of the Bach but um, after my experience with Chris I realized I got to go all the way and and just you know bring in a baroque bow um, play use use the five stringer for for the for the six suite and um, you know it was just there was no, there was no turning back basically after the Beethoven. The Beethoven was the window into that into that concept for us. And, and um, so anyway, thank you all so much for taking the time. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Pleasure. Yeah. By, and right. by the way, that recording of the Beethoven is a great recording. It's a wonderful recording. Yeah, we love it. Really, I did. It's fantastic. Thank you for doing Thanks it. Thanks so much. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thanks all. all. Everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you all so much for doing the hangout. Our YouTube page is youtube.com slash crossovermedianet, and our Facebook page will post all about our artist hangouts and um, artist news. So thanks again to everyone for watching and for participating in our hangout. Thank you.